That sounds good. Hey, so, um, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the first of, we hope, many, many um, virtual and in-person workshops and conversations at Creator Square. My name is Paul Rosenblatt, and I am the founding director of Creator Square, and I'm joined here by Taylor Fence, who is our first maker in residence at Creator Square and our first on-site manager. So, um, hi, Taylor. Hello. Um, tonight, we're going to do three things. Um, we're going to introduce Creator Square sort of briefly. I think a lot of you know a little bit about it, and what we hope to do through a conversation is to sort of unpack those things as opposed to talk to you, um, make it more of a conversation. Um, and secondly, um, in this conversation, we're also going to learn more about Taylor, um, what brought her to Creator Square, what a maker in residence is and does, what she does in spe specifically. We're going to see a little bit of her work, I think, right, Taylor? Yeah. Um, and then. And then finally, we're gonna talk about how you can get involved at Creator Square, whether you're a maker or an artist or an artisan, um, whether you, how you can apply for a residency, how you can also get involved in other ways. Um, so those are the, that, that's the, the plan tonight. Um, we're gonna to try to finish up by eight o'clock. So that's an ambitious plan. Um, before we get into a little background about Creator Square, we have a lot of organizations to thank. So I'm just gonna um, refer to my notes here um, and tell you that the, the Creator Square program was envisioned and supported through a number of organizations. Carnegie Mellon University, Community Foundation for the Alleghenies, JARI, Southern Alleghenies Planning and Development, Development Commission, Startup Alleghenies, Discover Downtown Johnstown Partnership, Entrepreneurial Alchemy, City of Johnstown, and the Johnstown Redevelopment Authority. Funding sources include the Pennsylvania Department of Community and Economic Development, the U.S. Economic Development Administration, the U.S. Department of Defense, Cambria County Government, Community Foundation for the Alleghenies, and private donations. So thank you to all of those organizations and to many, many individuals, um, really too many to name tonight. And if I started, we wouldn't be out of here by eight o'clock. So, but thank you. Um, so a little background about Creator Square. How did this get started? Um, well, I have to tell you that um, I'm an architect and as you can see also an artist in my, uh, especially during COVID times. Um, and in, in my um, capacity as an architect, my firm Springboard Design has done several projects in Johnstown. And through the years that we started to work in Johnstown on a number of projects, including an uh, incredible restaurant, balance restaurant, including working for the uh, Johnstown Flood Museum and other organizations, um, I fell in love with Johnstown. And the things I fell in love with were the, um, really the, 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 the things that make a place a place. So the heritage of the city, the story of the city, the heritage of manufacturing, and what I guess occurred to me was that there was a disconnect between that manufacturing heritage and the maker's movement. And um, it's, there, there seemed to be an opportunity to bring other people to Johnstown who might also be inspired in the same way and um, connect the dots between the makers movement, um, new small batch manufacturing technologies that uh, Taylor will talk about in a few minutes with me um, and the sort of the DNA of, of, uh, of making and manufacturing um, in, in, in creativity in Johnstown. So um, the focus of Creator Square as a residency is not so much on giving um, fine artists a place to make fine art. It's not that at all. What it really is, is a place for makers, whether they're artists or designers or craftspeople um, to 
learn how new small batch manufacturing technologies can help artists like that to scale their production um, as well as make one of a kind things. So it's really leveraging, learning, learning to leverage technology to, to sort of um, transform their artistic practices into businesses. That's it in a nutshell. Um, I got that right, Taylor, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Johnstown, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Johnstown is an amazing place. And that's part of why I fell in love with it. It's got a lot of um, lively arts um, organizations already. It has uh, a burgeoning food scene, um, creative chefs and restaurants opening up. It's got the steepest vehicular incline in the country, which sort of was exciting to me um, to ride on. Um, and maybe most exciting to me, it's got the oldest record store in the country, uh, George's Song Shop. And over the years, um, if nothing else, I've gotten um, to be friends with John George, who is the um, owner of George's Song Shop, the son of the founder who's run it since 1960. So he's run it longer than his dad did, who founded it. Um, I love stories like that. And there are lots of stories like that in Johnstown. That's part of Johnstown's um, charm. And these, all of these stories are continuously being brought up to, up to date. Um, I'm gonna briefly um, summarize the benefits of Creator Square. And then I'm gonna um, shift gears and we're, then Taylor and I are, are gonna talk, okay? Um, so the benefits in a nutshell are Johnstown, immersing yourself, immersing makers in the community, offering entrepreneurship coaching and development opportunities, local commissions, equity and capacity building, et cetera. A transition from art to business, access to technology. We, we have, once we're up and all the equipment is actually on site or most of it, once it's all set up and that's part of what we're doing this month, um, we'll have uh, a huge capacity of technology to aid in um, this transformation of um, artistic practices into, into manufacturing. Um, pathways to marketplace, residencies for sustained development so that people have a place to work and develop their businesses um, that's stable, um, business and entrepreneurship coaching, and finally professional development opportunities that include teaching, workshops, presentations, and exhibitions. So that's the end of my sort of um, marketing spiel, I guess, for Creator Square. Um, Taylor, I, I, before we get into our conversation, do you wanna um, maybe tell us a little bit about yourself, um, where you grew up, went to school, what you do, maybe show us some of your work. Sure, yeah. Um, I grew up in Indiana and I spent pretty much my whole life up until two years ago in Muncie, Indiana. Um, and I, I went to university at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Um, I graduated there with my BFA in fine arts with a concentration in metals, I think is, is, uh, is the correct way that that's written on my <laughs> degree. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's fine arts with a, with a concentration in metals. And I, I um, was lucky enough to study my first semester under Pat Nelson, who's a really incredible enamel, enamelist. And, um, and then the, the rest of my time there, I was um, learning under Jessica Calderwood, who's another fantastic enamelist. So it's maybe a little comical that I don't do any enameling. <laughs> but, but I mean, absolutely incredible professors. And um, before going to university, I had been metalworking or I guess playing with to some extent, because I started when I was 16 and I started building up studio equipment. And um, I had a small studio space downtown Muncie where I was working when I started university and I started in anthropology and I wouldn't stay out of the studio. And so I had to talk to my professor and tell her I can't, you know, I, I keep staying too late at the studio and I just really want to be in there. And she was like, well, you know, if you're worried about having a sustainable career in some field, you're no more likely to get that in anthropology than you would be 
um, in the arts. Uh, so you might as well go do what's keeping you up at night. And it was the perfect advice. She was completely correct as far as my trajectory at that point and my art completely changed and exploded. And I was challenged in so many different ways. And I rekindled my love for learning and academia and experimentation and, um, and yeah, so I wanted to keep doing that, obviously, after I graduated with my BFA and um, through a couple different avenues and, then, and through an internship, uh, I found myself here. Um, and so I can show you a little bit of my work, a kind of my, let's see, got a screen share here. Can you guys see yeah. the PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. So um, I'm not gonna, well, I didn't plan on talking too much about the conceptual side of my work because I figured we'd have plenty to, to talk about with Creator Square and, and, and what we have going now and, and then our goals and, and all of that. So I'll just kind of briefly go through some pictures to show you guys a feel for the style of my work. Um, and I'd encourage anyone who's interested in the conceptual side to maybe go to my website when I've updated my artist statement. <laughs> and can you talk a little bit just about the materials that we're looking at? Sure. Okay. What so, um, what we're looking at. yeah, th these are, I mean, mostly metal. It's everything in there is metal except for the wheat in the center, which is dried wheat. Um, and what, how did, like, this particular piece, Taylor? How do you make something like that? Um, well, tools? I started out, huh? What tools would you use? Um, a lot. I think <laughs> as far as the craft field goes, and as far as my experience, you know, with other crafts, I think jewelers tend to be tool geeks. And they, I mean, there's just so many and we use so many different types of tools and they're a variety of hand tools and some power tools and new technologies nowadays. Um, and the metals field is kind of expanding its definition of what a metal worker is and allowing, like I know metal workers who don't use any metal anymore. They only use plastic, but they have a background in metal working. So, so that has only just grown our um, collection or our capacity to collect tools. Um, so as far as what tools I use, I could go on just an outrageous list and I can name a few of them, um, but I start most of this stuff. I, I don't want to misquote myself, but I think everything that's in this slide, yeah, started out from uh, raw materials, either sheet metal, wire, or tubing. And it's all been, um, I cut it all with a jeweler's saw, so I cut it all by hand and um, soldered each piece and fabricated it, you know, really delicately. Um, I have a lot of intricate fabrication and soldering in my work. Um, and then most of this work has a, a coloring on it that is not a patina and it's not enamel, but it's a process of applying acrylic paint to metal. Um, and it's just all about how you treat the surface of the metal and then how you treat each layer of the paint to get it to be permanent. I mean, I've made bracelets and bangles with this finish on it. And um, my friend Katie wears it around as she's in the wood shop and says she hasn't shipped any of it off. So it's really durable if you treat it right. Um, and so same with these here, these are pipeline earrings. So that, that piece that was just on the screen I made for a show called Front of the House, Back of the House. and. Uh, we were asked to make a piece that dealt with um, opposing concepts in some way. So two sides of a coin, essentially. And um, I guess I'll talk about that piece. That's, that, that's one of my favorite pieces to talk about the concept, but I won't take too much time on the others. Uh, so going back to this piece, the, the two-sided concept for me was thinking about um, agriculture and domestication of different plants. I was reading a book by, um, oh, the, the name just slipped my mind. It's called Sapiens. 
and I cannot pronounce his first name, but uh, the book Sapiens, if you look it up, it should pop up. And um, there was a concept in there questioning whether or not when we domesticated wheat, did it actually domesticate us? And I thought that was really interesting because as soon as we started growing wheat, we had to stay still. And so in addition to having this piece of wheat kind of captivated in a silo-like pendant, the, the pin stem is actually like a deadbolt on a barn house door. So it's locking onto the body. So that was my way of describing two sides of the same coin. But then I, I yeah. So, and then these pipes were the second, some, uh, some work that I did after that brooch outside of um, undergrad. And I made a series of them. And there were a lot of brooches related to these and bangles. And there was this whole series, this line of jewelry that I made, um, painted pipes. So I was really interested in um, industrial landscapes. Um, I was almost going to move to Whiting, Indiana, which is a town situated within an oil refinery. And inside the town, you can hardly see anything but pipes. And it's just this like jungle of steam and fire and chemicals and pipes. And it was kind of scary and but interesting at the same time. And so I was making a lot of pipes, I guess, in response to that. And these were a pair of earrings I made for uh, Chicago Chandelier. It was an exhibition um, that was participating within SNAG, the annual SNAG conference, which is Society of North American Goldsmiths. Um, and so I wanted to make a pair of chandeliers that was kind of related to the industrial you know, like work that I was making. And so they spin and they're kind of like carousels. And it was this feeling of when I was in one of those industrial places or the refinery, I could just spin around and it just never ended. It was just like completely surrounding me. So I made a pair of chandelier earrings for that show. And this was a brooch I made after visiting Pittsburgh for one of the first times. I was visiting there because I'd made some friends there and I'd started dating someone from Pittsburgh. And so one of the times that I had visited there early on. Uh, I was really inspired by the tunnels and the architecture and how it cuts into the really hilly landscape of Pittsburgh. And I also made a pair of building earrings because just I was fascinated by how packed the different types of buildings were. And it was, they were kind of cartoony and almost, I, they looked like they're kind of out of Pee Wee's Playhouse a little bit. It was, I think it was the road. It was a road going towards the mattress factory. I remember that. Um, so yeah, I made a line of jewelry after visiting Pittsburgh. And this is a line of jewelry I made while I was at Touchstone over this past summer. Um, I, it was pretty organic how that started. It wasn't based on the landscape around that area. Um, because Touchstone's out in the middle of nature. So <laughs> there actually wasn't a lot of that like industrial inspiration. And so I wanted to immediately get to the bench and start working and I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to work on. So I just started practicing a technique that I didn't, that I hadn't done before just to kind of get the juices flowing. And so I started micro brazing um, on steel with brass. And so I was working on a scale that I would usually work with silver on and uh, using steel, which conducts heat differently. And it's just a whole nother bear and I was connecting it with, instead of silver solder, I was connecting it with, I was like, essentially the brass was my solder. And so I really liked the grimy feel because I like, and I wasn't, at first I probably just wasn't very good and I would just glob it on trying to get it all, you know, connected. Um, and then I would grind it and sand it down and it left these kind of welts on the surface and I thought that looked like the wear and tear you might see on old buildings and I really loved it. And so then I intentionally, even though I was really good at filling that seam over time, I still just globbed it on because it was a really nice organic um, texture on the surface and something I didn't have as much control over, which I usually have so much control over my work. So like letting go of some of that control was really exciting. And I made this line of jewelry in addition to some other there's some more pieces, but that's just a little sample of some of that jewelry. I also made this sculpture 
while I was there. So I wanted to incorporate something from the environment around me um, because I think I was just so used to doing that in my old work and that's just what inspires me. So I took some rocks out of the river that runs through Touchstone and I wanted to kind of carve into them as if they're the landscape, kind of like what I did in in this brooch. Um, I'm sure like, you know, it's, it's not something entirely that I hadn't done before was incorporating rocks, but I wanted to bring that back in with some of the rocks from Touchstone. So yeah, I was active. I was using these rocks as the, the base for these, you know, man-made structures and trying to create some sort of narrative there. And this was the big sculpture that I was really excited to complete over the summer. This was my big goal. I wanted to take that brooch design and make a bigger piece. So this, this is huge to me. However, it's only about nine inches tall and like six, six inches wide. And that's like really big to me, especially since I treated it. The process was similar to how I make the brooches. So I cut all of it by hand and micro welded it all by hand, just like I would the small jewelry. So that was, I was really excited. And I, this is a rock that I cut into quarters like that um, by scoring a line where I wanted it and then hitting it with a hammer under leather and breaking it and then sanding it flat. So a little bit of really, I don't even know if I can call it lapidary work I have then, it's stone work, I don't know. And now after my residency there, um, thanks to Lindsay and, and Paul, Lindsay for connecting me with Paul, um, I'm, in this space. So I'm, these are some samples I'm working on right now as I'm also trying to like fix up my space here and welcome our resident Katie uh, Gieselman and um, a plethora of other projects that Paul and I have going on. I uh, sneak in studio time where I can and I'm working on these uh, texture and color samples on some of those buildings and different scales. The difference is that I started laser cutting. So these were not cut by hand I've been incorporating laser cut pieces. So instead of just one piece every, you know, it might take me an hour to cut out one piece, but now I have this, I have all of these that I can braise. I can braise a line of them and then clean them up all together and test color. So it's, I do the initial one by hand still, and there's still a lot of hand in these pieces, but the mass production and like the ability to make so many pieces at once really frees me up to explore with texture and form and connecting them in different ways. So it's, it's I think that there's some really exciting work that's gonna come from that. And this is a shot of my metal studio area. Um, this is my little makeshift soldering station until I can get a better bench. It's actually just a, a shelving piece of shelf, but it's just perfect for the scale I'm working on right now. And here's a, a long shot of my jeweler's bench and um, some equipment on this bench over here. And then I have my drawing desk back there. Yeah. Thanks, Taylor. That's an awesome um, introduction to your work. And um, I don't think I've seen all of that work before and I really appreciate it. And um, you're in the chat, there are some comments about how beautiful this work is. So that's really great. Mm -hmm. But it's also, um, you know, why we selected you to be the first artist in residence. Um, but also, um, it, it, you know, it's also evidence of how you're taking advantage of being. And I think this leads to my next question for you, um, which we've talked about before. But um, what, it, what initially attracted you to apply for this residence? And what do you hope to achieve during this residence? I'm trying to switch my screen from shared screen. I can't figure out how to do it. You go down to share screen and, and click that button. Otherwise you can just leave it up. Yeah. It, it's usually on the top of the screen where it, there'll be a little X that says stop sharing. Ah, oh, there you go. Oh, I see. Okay. Stop sharing. Ha ha ha, thank you. <laughs> so Dreamwork is dream work. Okay, sorry, Paul, what, what, was, it, what was your question? Thank you. <laughs> what, what I was asking you, what, what attracted you to apply for residency and 
What do you hope to achieve during this residency? Um, how, how long is the residency? Let's talk a little bit about what 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 makes you want to be a, a, a maker in residence at Career Square. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so my residency will be two years, um, and I would love to stay on longer as the site manager. So I think I'm lucky. I might be lucky enough to stay even longer than two years in some capacity. Uh, and I was attracted to this residency in particular uh, for personally, because I was really interested in how new it was and how young it was and excited by the opportunity to get in there when it was you know, there were still so many possibilities and I could watch it grow from a younger point. And I think that's a fantastic learning opportunity. Um, there's one thing to be said for jumping into a residency that's extremely established and then coming in on one that still has um, so many directions it could go and so many different, so much progress it could make and, and so many things that could happen. So that potential is really exciting to me and getting to watch it watch the story from the ground up is, is cool. Um, and then specifically the type of residency, I think is obviously really important. And it's that one, it was founded and created by an artist or maybe two, if I'm, if I'm maybe there might be more than just Paul, uh, someone who's familiar with the arts and a lot of art supporting people. And so I knew that, you know, even with this, focus on small business, there's this appreciation for the arts, which I think is important to me. Um, and then going from that, the, the mixing of uh, manufacturing styles that's supported here. So, so there's an understanding and appreciation for fine arts, uh, crafts, and um, small to large batch manufacturing. And to combine all of those into one creative space allows for people to be creative in a variety of capacities, which is really exciting to me because it means that I can keep making my art and growing that, the conceptual art, and I can also really like grow a product line or develop or engineer something that I might not have had the tools or resources or understanding to do before. So I think those are probably the biggest reasons. Yeah. And what, what, what are your goals? Um, my, <laughs> I have a list, <laughs> I have a long list of goals. Um, I'll talk just specific. I have a lot of goals as the on-site manager. I'm really excited about having the opportunity to inspire other makers and, and grow the programming and things like that. But I'll, I'll focus more on, on the residency part of it. Um, yeah, I want to make sure I don't forget anything. <laughs> So, yeah, so the a few goals I have would be the networking and connecting with people in this area and the creative people and the arts supporting people, which I've already had the opportunity to do a lot, which has been exciting. I have already met so many people. There's so many people in this area that are so enthusiastic for the, for the growing um, arts related nonprofits or programs that are starting up here. I mean, there's Center for the Metal Arts, there's um, the Art House, which I got to stay for a while at and um, get to know more scene really well. And there's, there's Gallery on Gazebo, there's, there's um, Bottle Works. I mean, I could go to the Studio 32. There's so many different arts places and I've gotten to meet all these people and they're so excited and wanting to help and like build relationships. It's, so that's one thing and I've already gotten to do it a lot. Um, Another is going to be legitimizing my business because although I've sold a lot of my work uh, in undergrad and things like that, it never was solidified in any business models um, or real, I, mean, I guess just, yeah, business models. When I, and I didn't track my sales. I didn't do any of that. It was really going blind and I was using that money to buy new materials and maybe build my equipment or or you know, get an extra beer that night. So <laughs> being able to actually take a serious look at my income and expenses and 
understand what it takes to actually run a business that sustains myself and potentially a few more makers. So that might be a goal of mine. Can I sustain myself through some business model and production line along with a few other makers? That would be really cool. Maybe even residents coming in, like if, if the residents leaving here have small businesses and they stay in the area, I mean, that could be a way for the residents coming in to work a part-time job as they're growing theirs. So that, I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of room for connecting and building a network in this area. So um, Taylor, you don't, you don't sound very ambitious when, when no? you talk like, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Those are amazing ambitions. Um, yeah. So, you know, um, makes me um, want to ask you about um, what you would want other people to know about who might be interested in applying for this residency. Yeah. Um, for them to know about. Yeah, there's, I think there's two really important things that I want to talk about. Um, and one is that we are definitely looking at artists to come, you know, build a small business here, but makers in all kind of aspects of making. So, I mean, if you're not so much an artist and you're an engineer or you're not an engineer, but you like, you kind of think like an engineer and you've, you've developed some product that you're really excited about, but you don't know how to produce it, or you don't know how to start a business to actually legitimize the product and sell it this is a place that is excited to welcome all types of makers. Um, so not only sh should people know that, but that's really exciting because then the more different types of makers we can have here collaborating, the more um, open the creative flow can be for each individual. So I might uh, really get some of my questions answered. If I've never designed a jewelry box, I could really get a lot of help from an engineer potentially, or potentially an engineer could be inspired by the design that goes into, or the concept that goes into fine art and crafts. Um, so the collaboration there could be really cool. So I, I hope that we get a variety of different types of makers in here. And the other thing I wanted to talk about was the studio and how it's equipped for individuals and the community and what we don't necessarily offer because it's more of like a individual studio thing that we might expect the individual artists to have. So we have a variety of tools um, currently on site and more being shipped here and more that we would like to get into the future. Um, and these are pieces of equipment that are really general pieces of equipment that the majority of makers could use, like a lot of woodworking tools. So Katie makes her own frames. She's a painter. So she's going to use that woodworking tool to build her frames. Um, and I might use that woodworking tool or woodworking tools to make pedestals or displays for my work um, or a prototype jewelry box. So um, we have a lot of equipment like that we're going to get. We have laser cutters coming, uh, two different types, metal laser cutter, and a, and a soft material laser cutter, um, and they're big. And we have two 3D printers coming, an extrusion printer and a, a laser printer. And we have two really nice Mac computers that will control all of those on the downs on the first floor. And then on the second floor, we have some screen printing equipment, woodworking equipment, a bench grinder, we're getting a metal shear. So just a variety of really big stuff that it's really difficult for an individual to have built up on their own or I mean, this stuff is like, once you have these things, you're settled somewhere. And so typically the people that are really settled there, they have the small business or they have the studio because they worked a job. Like they're, they're not coming here anyway, but the people coming here wouldn't have that stuff. So, so we have those things. And then what we would expect um, the individual to bring would be their own studio with the specific tools they might need to make their stuff. So I have a pretty well outfitted studio of my own. Um, I've been building it since I was a teenager. But if you don't have that, most students coming out of undergrad don't have that. It's hard to build up. It takes a long time or it takes a lot of money. And so this is a really good place along with the support systems around town and um, 
the grant opportunities that we're always looking for and funneling towards our artists and commission opportunities as well. All of that can help someone without the, the equipment built up to maybe fund that equipment build up. So even if you don't have a fully functional studio, I think that this would be a fantastic place to build that and we would support someone doing that because that's definitely a necessary step if you want to keep making. Yeah, and that, that reminds me that I don't think I did a good job of describing the physical aspects of Creator Square. Um, so Taylor is sitting in her, um, it's the front studio on the third floor. There are four dedicated studios within the facility um, for four artisans. They're big enough to accommodate more than one artisan per studio. Um, and in addition to that, uh, the building is located on Gazebo Place in downtown Johnstown, um, which is the main the main park, the Central Park of Johnstown. Um, it's also called Central Park, and um, we have a storefront gallery, um, really high ceilings. I think they're like ten or eleven feet high ceilings, so we can do all kinds of different in installations, exhibitions, workshops, with presentations in that space. And then behind that, on the first floor, we have a collaboration space, um, which is meant to be a place, that's where our Macs are set up, but it's also a place to, um, for our, our makers and residents to meet each other on a daily basis, to collaborate, um, to talk with each other, et cetera. Um, so it's a 6,000 square foot building on three floors. Um, each of the studios is dedicated to a different area, but the idea is that makers like Taylor will be able to go from concept to prototype to fabrication all on site. So they can develop ideas within this residency, prototype these ideas, test them out, and then develop an understanding of what the marketplace is like for this, whether there's a, whether people want to buy these things as cool as they might be, and then how to develop ways of making them affordably so that they can actually build a business around this this production. So I guess that hopefully gives a little bit of a, of, uh, a word picture of, of the, the, the facility. Um, so Taylor, um, what questions do you want? Do you want to ask me? Do you have any questions for me at this point? You and I have been talking for months now. <laughs> no, um, I don't have any questions. All of your questions already. But <laughs> are there any questions left? I do have one, um, and I'm curious if, and I, I've been curious about this because you're an artist and and really interested in these makers and you're constantly sending me videos of people who are, are making these products or a uh, cross between a product and more of an art piece. And so I'm curious if you've had any ideas of things that you've wanted to prototype or make uh, and how you might use this space or if you thought about using this space to to do that that's a really interesting question um and one i wasn't really prepared to answer not really prepared to answer um but as you know um my my training in architecture and in art is really sort of focused on fine arts so you know i don't have production skills i don't have shop skills you know i probably should have more shop skills than i do um but what I do have are ideas for making things. And so for me, um, the idea of, of collaborating with some of the makers in residence on design ideas for things like furniture or lighting fixtures um, would be really exciting. Um, and, you know, especially sort of mixed media, um, multi-material things. Um, when we, before Creator Square was open, um, we uh, collaborated with a, a Pittsburgh-based ceramics company called Stack Ceramics on lighting fixtures for the Balance Restaurant. I see Mark Artem on the on the in the meeting here. Mike um, is the owner of that restaurant, and um, that was a, a collaboration between Springboard Design, my architectural firm, Stack Ceramics, and um, Urban Tree did the wood, um, another Pittsburgh-based um, maker. Um, and so combining different materials into a product 
is it outside of my own capacity to make, but not my own capacity to imagine. So, yeah. you know, and I think that there might be some architects and designers out there who have more craft skills than I do or more shop skills who might be interested in actually becoming a maker in residence themselves and building a business. Um, it, you know, makes me think of one of my um, former students, Ben Sachs, who started a company called Curf Case um, that you know about. Yeah. Um, and Curf Case, you know, um, Ben uh, went to Carnegie Mellon University where I used to teach and um, he developed really great shop skills when he was there. And then instead of practicing architecture, he started his own craft-based business, which makes um, wooden, um, highly engineered wooden um, cases for smartphones. And um, so um, I, I imagine that Ben is not the only architecture student or design student who might have in interesting ideas for starting a craft based business. And Creator Square would be an interesting place to do that kind of thing. And that brings up a good point that, um, well, first off that there was, there was an architect from my university that I met in a philosophy class that contacted me asking if I would uh, produce some sort of copper fixture for a greenhouse that he designed. So it wasn't the right time or fit. I didn't have my studio with me at the time um, or access to a studio at the time. Uh, and I think that it, he was on a deadline that was unrealistic for me, but I love this idea that I want as many people who might be interested in designing something, but they don't have the means to do it themselves or they just don't want to, they'd rather outsource it to someone who has these different ideas and, and like incorporate different ideas into whatever they're thinking. Um, contacting us, contacting Creator Square and seeing if we have any residents that would be interested in commissions. Um, I know that I'm going to be doing one for the gallery on Gazebo for Rosemary and I'm really excited to get started on that and it's going to be, it's just, I mean, these commissions, typically a commission is something outside of what I would usually be doing, right, because it's, it's a commission, it's from someone else and so it's fantastic opportunity to experiment and do something that I wouldn't usually do. And oftentimes it inspires me and my work, um, or at least just gives me new experience. And it's, you know, and I make something something cool that I wouldn't usually get to. That's yeah. cool, that sounds yeah. great. So um, I'm just looking at the clock here. It's about quarter to eight. Yeah. Um, we've got 10 or 15 more minutes. Um, I'm wondering whether we should talk about how to apply for a residency, or if you, if, if you think there are other things that we, we should talk about Taylor before we get to that. Well, um, maybe we can go over it real fast and then open it up for questions. That sounds like a good idea. So, if um, <laughs> the 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 answer to how to apply for a residency, the easy answer is go to our website, and the the website is creatorsquarejohnstown.com. Um, everything you need to know is there. Um, mm -hmm. But in a nutshell, it's not that hard to apply. Um, what we're looking for is a letter of interest that explains to us who you are and what you do and why you are interested in participating in, in a residency um, and a link to your portfolio so we can see what your work looks like. Um, that's essentially how Taylor and also Katie um, got to be the first two makers in residence. It's not a formal, process. Um, we have a committee um, and eventually we will have a more formal um, application process. But as Taylor was talking about, these are early days for us and we are really excited to have people who are also excited to be a part of something new. Um, the, the, what, what, what kind of blows my mind is the magnitude of the equipment that we will have under roof and the the um, like when I when I talk to Katie and Taylor about what that equipment will enable craftspeople like them to do without having to send it out very expensively and have things laser cut or other technologies, um, it it I wish that I had those skills so I could use this equipment myself. Um, so that that's really I mean applying to be a maker at, at, in residence at Creator Square is not complicated. Um, what we've done is we've set the residency up as a membership organization. So basically 
At any given time, there will be four makers in residence under roof. Um, there is a cost to being a maker in residence, which is um, $500 a month. Um, so $500 per month to be a member, which not only gets you a, your studio and access to all of this equipment, access to training, but also access to business coaches, to links to commissions like Rosemary's and others. And um, we also have some grants already in place that help, will help some people to defray some of that cost. So if you have a special um, you know, hardship of some sort or just can't afford that, let us know and we'll see if we can help you find some funds to, to defray that cost. The residency duration is from one year to two years. Um, so either one year or two years, but we are also going to eventually, once we have all of the equipment up and running, um, open the doors for some classes and for people to begin to use our equipment on a more, um, on a less committed basis, shall we say, so that more like a, a traditional tech shop kind of maker space. That's a little bit in the future, um, but we also want to be able to make the tools and the knowledge base accessible to more people. So we absolutely intend to have not just virtual workshops like this through Creator Square, but also some in-person hands-on demonstrations um, and some hands-on classes um, like you might find at Contemporary Craft or, or other places. Um, I think that answers the how-to, right? Um, Maybe we can open this up to some questions or comments from the chat. Or um, if you if you have a question, and Taylor, you're gonna you're gonna facilitate this, right? Um, if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute your mic and you can ask the question. Maybe that's the best way to start. Let me see if I can. Anybody have any questions or comments? Or you can feel free to type it in the chat and we'll read it. That's also fine. Um, this is Mike Kane. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, I have less a question than a comment, which is uh, um, Taylor to just tell you how impressed I am with how you've dived into this work and, and, and to Johnstown and how you're uh, getting involved. And I think it's really tremendous. And I want to thank you for your vision in that regard. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing how Creator Square fills out and how it it creates um, just a cool kind of vibe on Gazebo Place with Rosemary and with uh, uh, the bookstore and, 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 and everything. And I can tell you uh, that one of the reasons uh, that uh, Rosemary has said that, that she's there is because of Creator Square. And one of the reasons that Mike Messina, uh, when he retired uh, from his regular job, committed to Chameleon Bookstore is because he thought with Creator Work Square coming, there would be a kind of vibe there and he wanted to be a part of it. So I think that's really something we wanted to see happen with Creator Square. And I'm looking forward to sort of seeing that evolve as we sort of open up after COVID and after winter and, uh, and, and we move into the time when we can all be together. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Um, I, I have one question come in on the chat block. Oh, a few, okay. So the first one is, will the artist be able to sell the pieces at that location? Yes. Yes, they will. Um, we'll be setting up the gallery for uh, one of a kind artworks, but also production works. Um, and we all, we'll also wanna have an online store too, um, as well as facilitating the exchange or not exchange, but interaction between local galleries in the area and our artists. So hopefully we'll be able to get them on a couple more sites as well. Um, another artist, or I'm sorry, another comment coming in from an artist <laughs> is, uh, are the residencies aimed at makers at any particular point in their career, um, emerging, mid-career, et cetera? Do you have any opportunities specifically for BYOOC makers? What's that? What's a BY or BIOOC maker? Not sure what that is, um, but I'll answer the first part maybe. Um, are the residencies aimed at makers at any particular point in their career? 
I'd say yes. Um, Paul, do you do you want to take that over? Yeah. Um, so because of the opportunities for transforming um, artistic practices into businesses, um, this may not be something that occurred to you or you had the opportunity to do right out of college or right out of grad school. And so there may be people out there who have been doing different craft activities or different maker activities in parallel to their day jobs um, or in parallel to being a parent or something. Um, and at some point would like to transform that into a more sustainable activity. So absolutely, um, you know, getting back to the equipment and the technologies, that's one reason, you know, people might not have access to this kind of equipment on their own, they probably don't. Um, so this will help to leverage and build up practices. But um, the one thing I don't think we talked enough about Taylor was the business coaching that you're getting and that every um, resident gets um, as part of membership in Creator Square. Um, so maybe you can talk about that, but that's a big, big part of the value proposition for being a maker in residence. Um, we have a relationship with Jari and there are business coaches there. In this case, um, Taylor is working with uh, Blake Flegel um, on doing the things that will help her to understand what it means to actually run, like um, develop a proper business plan, um, register your business. Um, what, what else are you and Blake working on at this point? Probably keeping track of finances, so keeping track of my sales and my expenses and a separate bank account. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, so some basic things, but pretty much figuring out where everybody is at the, you know, like where where each maker is um, in their in the development of their businesses. So Katie and Taylor are both at different points in the development of their businesses, but there might be somebody who is mid-career um, as opposed to emerging. Who, who needs that kind of um, business coaching, um, business assistance as well. And we're very much interested in having, making this a um, um, inclusive place, not just in terms of um, um, you know, diversity of experience, but also diversity of age. And um, yeah, to your question, Kristen, about um, Black, Indigenous, people of color. Yes, absolutely. Um, and you know, to, to that point, there might also be some um, grants or some special opportunities for different groups of people. So um, we'd love to talk with you and others about those kinds of things as we move forward as well. Yeah. There are a lot of people, a lot of organizations who are really invested in the success of Creator Square. We're eternally grateful to them and they continue to provide support. And as the months proceed, we will be announcing some other really exciting um, um, collaborations with other uh, existing organizations, both locally and also regionally, um, that will create even more opportunities for makers and residents um, to grow their businesses, but also to market and sell their work. Um, so we're really excited about that. Not quite ready to announce those things yet. Um, so just looking at the clock, are there other questions or comments? Um, Taylor, do you have anything you wanted to add? Alrighty. I don't think so. I'm reading. So thank you, Mike. Uh, if there if there aren't any um, last questions, I just want to thank everybody um, this evening who's here with us um, in these extraordinary times. Um, I think in some ways um, using this technology enables us to be together um, and maybe more of us to be together, um, but it's not the same as actually physically being in the same space. So someday we hope to see everybody in person at Creator Square. In the meantime, um, I just wanted to remind everybody that this is the first of a series of workshops that we plan at least one a month for the rest of the year. Um, there are already, a lot of them are already scheduled and we will be announcing them. So um, Taylor, you wanna talk a little bit about how people can find out about upcoming 
workshops and presentations. And, um, and then we can let everybody go. Yeah, so we're gonna try to, not try, we will be posting as often as we can updates about um, events to our Instagram, um, as well as Facebook. We didn't get an update on Facebook this time, but we're gonna try to do that for the following. So Instagram and Facebook pages. So be sure to go, if you're not already, uh, follow Instagram and friend us or li like us on Facebook. And, um, and then as well as email blasts. So um, if you go to our website, there, will, there should be an area where you can subscribe to our email list. Um, if you have trouble finding it, which I don't think you should, it should be at the top of a couple pages. Um, you can go ahead and email us and ask to, to be added to that, to that email list. And we send out periodic few, you know, we're not, we're not gonna drown you in emails, but just enough to let you know what's going on and update you on events and things like that. Thanks for that, Taylor, and and thank you, Jen, for your your offer there. Um, uh, if anybody wants to help us out, we are more than happy to have that help. <laughs> and the biggest the biggest help at this point is really to spread the word to help promote um, what we're offering. And even if you think there are people that we should talk to who might be interested or have questions, one of the things that Taylor and I are always um, available to do is is um, take a call with people or meet with people in person or, or like this. Um, and if you have questions after this, I, I hope this was a useful hour. I hope that we um, did a good job of explaining why we're here, why Creator Square exists and what we hope to, to achieve. Um, but I imagine we didn't answer all of your questions. And so please don't hesitate to reach out to us with your questions and we will be, we'll do everything we can to try to to try to address them. So thanks again, Taylor, you want to say thanks too? Thank you so much. This is so nice. <laughs> and thank you all. It really, really means a lot to us that you guys spent, um, gave an hour of your time this evening to join us. We really appreciate it.